Okay, so about 15 years ago, uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin came into the scene. When I first found out about Bitcoins and cryptocurrency, I thought this was a, this was a scam. I was an unbeliever, but I wanted to know more. So I joined some interest groups, some local interest groups. I went to some conferences, did a lot of research. And this talk is basically a culmination of all the information I found over the, over the last 10 years. So hopefully at the end of the talk, you will know more than you know now about Bitcoins, blockchains, and cryptocurrency. Uh, I'm legally required to make the statement. This work was done as a private venture, not in the author's capacity as an employee of Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. Moving on. So since Bitcoin came into the scene, there has been significant interest in Bitcoins. And this interest is mostly from general public, investors and traders, financial market, such as Dow, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, Coinbase, et cetera. Corporations are interested uh, like Tesla, JP Morgan. These companies are also interested in Bitcoins and cryptocurrency. Government officials are also interested like politicians, policymakers, SEC. So since cryptocurrency came into the scene, there has a knowledge gap, a crypto knowledge gap, a gap has appeared. And that knowledge gap is basically classified people into three different groups. So the first group is the believers. The second group is the doubters. And the third group is the curious. So at this point, I would like to take a poll and Behruz can help me with this. So if you are group number one, go to your chat box and send a one to everyone. If you are group number two, send a two to in your chat box. And if you are group number three, if you are the curious, send a three to Behruz. And, and if you can, Behruz, in after a couple of slides, just add the ones, add the twos, and add the threes, and announce it. By the way, can you all see the screen? I, I am kind of cutting off. I'm seeing part of it cut off. Okay. That didn't work. Oh, I suggest that if you can go into slideshow mode, that may help with the image problem. This uh, this isn't PowerPoint, is it? Slideshow from the beginning. How about this? Yeah, yeah, much better. Over here, okay. I don't see the chat box this way, but I'll let you handle it. All right, so the believers. These are the people who believe that cryptocurrency will liberate us from tyranny of the banking system. Cryptocurrency will protect our savings from the lack of fiscal discipline of the government. Cryptocurrency will free the free market economy. They believe they trade create or mine cryptocurrency. There is a local group here in, based on Thousand Oaks, uh, which consists of a lot of the believers. It's called 805 Startup Techies and Entrepreneurs. So if you are interested, you can look them up and join. Okay, then we have the doubters. These are the people who believe that cryptocurrency is a bunch of hooey. They believe cryptocurrency is a scam. I used to be one of them. Cryptocurrency is a pyramid scheme. 
cryptocurrency is a mad science. All right, then we have the curious. These are the people who think that cryptocurrency sounds interesting, would like to know more. So this lecture is mostly designed for this group of people. Now, the last time I did this talk, uh, one of the audience said that there is a fourth group and the fourth group consists of the people who don't care. But I don't think we have any of those here because if you didn't care, you won't be here. So in this lecture, we will talk about cryptocurrency, blockchain, and Bitcoin. Okay, before you continue, let me announce the poll result. Uh, four people answered one, one person answered two, and 11 people answered three. And one person answered 2.5. <laughs> Probably the don't uh, don't care. <laughs> so that's good. So uh, this this lecture is designed for the number three. So majority are there, and I hope I can convince the number ones. On, I was uh, forced to answer two point five because my middle name is Thomas. Oh, you said two point five. All right. Somewhere so, between. Now I know the demographics of the, of the audience. All right, so cryptocurrency definition. There are five characteristics of cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a digital currency. Currency does not have a physical form. It can be issued by organizations other than central banks. It is a peer-to-peer -peer currency and it can be transacted without the traditional banking system. All right, so there are some well-known cryptocurrencies already out there. I am trying to remove this audience window, sorry, that is blocking my screen. Okay, here we go, sorry. Okay, so there are uh, well-known examples of cryptocurrency. Airline miles. Uh, airline miles is a type of cryptocurrency. It's used to purchase um, airline tickets, magazines, etc. Credit card points uh, can be used to purchase products through credit cards. Timeshare points, like if you purchase a Hilton timeshare, they give you points. And with that, you can use hotel stay, cruise tickets, etc. So we already are aware or use cryptocurrencies. So now imagine this, all shops and vendors shared a point system in your town. Consumers could accumulate points by eating in restaurants and then use those points to buy a pair of shoe in another store. Or you could get points from grocery shopping and then use those points to buy gas. Well, this already exists. Vons and Chevron have a deal, so you can use Vons points to get discount on gas from Chevron gas stations. So we already use a form of cryptocurrency in our daily lives. The objective of the cryptocurrency of today is to make it a more ubiquitous currency. All right, so now imagine this. You own a business, say you own a restaurant in your town. You want to expand your business, so you need money. You can go to a bank and take a loan, but the interest rate's too high. And this is one of the issues with small businesses is that it's extremely difficult for them to get a loan from the bank because banks want collateral. And uh, small businesses usually don't have collateral other than their stoves or you know, or their inventory. And in the case of a restaurant, inventory doesn't have much value because it's all uh, perishable. So in most cases, the small business owners have to mortgage their homes, uh, they use their homes as a equity to get business loans to fund their business, which is not a good option. So 
so there, there is a solution that, to that. So in a new age, what you would do is you would create an investment grade cryptocurrency in the yeah, backed by your restaurant, equity in your restaurant, say XYZ. Now investors can purchase XYZ from your business. In return, investors own part of your business. Advantage for an investor is they will benefit if your expansion is successful and price of XYZ will go up. Another advantage is they can sell it to other investors if they want to cash out. Advantage for the business owner is they get to raise funds without high interest rates or without having to mortgage their homes. You can buy XYZ cryptocurrency back or the restaurant owner can buy the XYZ back from the marketplace if they have uh, cash and uh, uh, they want to uh, not have their ownership out in the public. So objective of the cryptocurrency is to facilitate investments and funding. Now I have a personal example. Um, I had a friend, I have a friend who had an Indian restaurant in Camarillo and uh, he was doing really well. He, uh, he succeeded for 11 years and then COVID hit. And uh, he, uh, the business went down and he couldn't pay the rent. So the landlord evicted him. So he lost his business. Now, fast forward 10 years when cryptocurrency is ubiquitous and it's everywhere. So what he could have done is First, he would have the email address or the contact information of all the people who have purchased food from him via Uber Eats or any of these platforms. So what he would do is he would issue cryptocurrency in his business name. He would send an email to all his customers saying that, you know, I am in dire straits, help me uh, buy my cryptocurrency. Now, had I had that option, I would have been happy to invest a few hundred dollars and buy his cryptocurrency. Now, he, with that money, he, he could have weathered the storm of COVID. And then later on, he could have, when the business picked up, he could have purchased those uh, cryptocurrency back, or he could have offered meals in return for that cryptocurrency. So, so that would have been a good option and he could have saved his business. So does everyone understand the benefit that cryptocurrency could bring? Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, this is Michael Ellis in Thousand Oaks. Um, the examples you gave, the airline miles and things like that, those are all controlled by a central entity, whereas Bitcoin isn't, as I understand it. Is that correct? Yeah. So I have a whole section on Bitcoin, and we will go there. Uh, and right now, I am just talking about cryptocurrency, which is the upper class of the Bitcoin. Bitcoin A is a type of cryptocurrency. Okay, thank you. So there was a question in my last talk. Uh, do you think cryptocurrency will remain open currency once the government gets involved? So the answer is government gets involved in the currency regulation for two main reasons. First is to collect taxes from the transaction. Second is to protect the public from fraud. So IRS and local governments need a record of transactions so it can collect taxes. Whereas SEC needs to make sure that the investment grade cryptocurrency meet a certain standard. So cryptocurrency believers believe that free market should be free of regulation. The ownership of assessing the risk should be on the buyer of the asset, not on the government body. However, sooner or later, government will try to regulate currencies. There are no, no other questions, I'll move on. 
next slide is now we are in a section which will talk about blockchain. So the definition of blockchain is a, a blockchain is a growing list of records called blocks, which are interconnected by utilizing cryptography. Blockchain is a type of database. So to understand blockchain, we need to understand database. So a definition of database, a database is an organized collection of data generally stored and assessed electronically from a computer system. So in this slide, we see several different types of database, several different architecture database. So this is a flat file model. This is a hierarchical model, relational model. Here is a object oriented model and here's a network based model. So moving on. So blockchain. So here is a diagram of a blockchain architecture. So in a blockchain architecture, each block contains a cryptographic hash of previous block, a timestamp, and exchange information. Utilizing blockchain, we can safely store information over the shared system where everybody can see but can't do any alternation. So if you had to uh, draw a physical model of this, imagine you have a box of files. So you, you have a box of files that you filled up. It's old information. You put a lid on it and you put it and put another box on top of it and then start filling it up with new files. So now what happens is if you have, if you want to go to the first box, it's sitting under the second box. So you can't access it without moving the first box, uh, without moving the second box. So thus you can't alter anything on the first box. So that is, that is the idea of a blockchain. It's, it's a series of blocks, which is essentially stacked on top of each other. Everyone can look into it, but no one can change the information in a block that has already been closed. Any questions? What is a nonce? I think it's a time of type of stamp that they put on. Uh, I'm not sure the exact definition of what is in there, but it is unique to that block. So that's how the blocks are distinguished. All right, no questions. So now this section we'll talk about Bitcoin. So there are five characteristics of a Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a digital currency. So it's a, it's a type of cryptocurrency. It is a decentralized currency. It is one of many cryptocurrencies. Uh, it is a currency for peer-to-peer -peer transactions and it bypasses the banking system. So some history about Bitcoin. Bitcoin was invented by an unknown person with a name, with an alias, Satoshi Nakamoto. In 2008, Nakamoto write, wrote a white paper defining the framework of a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. In January of 2009, he implemented Bitcoin with open source software. Uh, Bitcoin network was created when Nakamoto mined the, the starting block of the chain known as the Genesis block. Embedded in the coin base of this block was the text uh, times 03 January 2009, Chancellor on the brink of second bailout of the banks. So the rumor has it that Nakamoto lived in Germany I guess the chancellor, that gives us a clue. So he was upset that, uh, that the 
government, the central banks were printing money to bail out banks. So in turn, central banks and the government were devaluing the currencies. In the process, public savings were being devalued. So the governments were hurting the individuals to help the government's uh, corporation's bad behavior. So he wanted to create a currency whose supply was limited. The currency was decentralized and democratic and no one institution had the authority to increase the supply. So Bitcoin implementation. In 12 January, 2009, a person by the name of Hal Finney downloaded the Bitcoin software and received 10 Bitcoins from Nakamoto. In 2010, first commercial transaction by Bitcoin was recorded when a programmer by the name of Laszlo Hennisk brought two Papa John's pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins. The price of those two pizzas in today's price of Bitcoin was greater than $500 million. It is estimated that Satoshi Nakamoto had mined about 1 million Bitcoins before he disappeared in 2010. The value of Nakamoto's Bitcoin is greater than $58 billion, making him the 20th richest man in the world. Before disappearing, Nakamoto handed over the network alert key and the control of the code repository to a programmer named Gavin Anderson. So it was a perfect crime. He created something, he took his share and then disappeared. Any questions? I have a question. Um, you said in your example with the Indian restaurant that he could create investment grade Bitcoins and offer them for sale. But then you just said that one of the reasons for Bitcoin was to keep the supply limited or constant. That doesn't sound like it fits to me. Yeah. So I think that we have to make a distinction between cryptocurrency and there are literally thousands of them and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a type of cryptocurrency. So I will go over how Bitcoin cryptocurrency is created. Now, the other type of cryptocurrency I'm talking about, like my friend's restaurant, he won't be creating Bitcoin. He would be creating a type of cryptocurrency it may be called, his restaurant was called Curry Leaf. So he will have a Curry Leaf coin. And that will be his cryptocurrency created in a platform, uh, like say Coinbase or something, one of the platforms. And it will trade um, as his cryptocurrency. So it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is its own entity. This will be regulated or this will be bought and sold by the market by the market maker in a platform. Okay, thank you. So there was a question on my last talk. If blockchain is open to everyone, then government should be able to access the records and track the transaction. The answer is that the cryptocurrencies are essentially numbers. The ownership of the currency is held by crypto wallets, which is also numbers. So the transactions happen between wallets. Personal information of the owner of the wallet is not recorded. So this is how it's, it's um, uh, hidden. So it's kind of like, a, you know, back in the day, they had Swiss bank accounts, which didn't have names, but numbers and criminals would save money in, in those accounts, the ill-gotten gains in those accounts. And governments couldn't, access them uh, so it's that idea any other questions so is it actually up to the both parties when that transaction occurs that it's safe so like if you were to do that transaction you basically have to trust the other party 
since that personal information of the owner is not of the wallet is not recorded? So yes, so I have a slide which uh, explains the transaction method. So I think uh, it it will be more clear when I go through the go, go through the slides. So please hold your thought. Any other questions? I have a question. <clears throat> the mystery of Nakamoto disappearing and Gavin Anderson coming into the forefront. Um, is there any explanation or any reason to worry or wonder? Yes, so there was a there was an incident a few years back where uh, someone started a humor saying that so many Bitcoins disappeared and that made the Bitcoins crash. And they, uh, they uh, you know, quelled everybody's suspicion that there was something shady going on. But, uh, but to answer your question, uh, you will have to ask Nakamoto why he disappeared. Uh, I suppose uh, when you are uh, in control of such a large wealth, uh, you know, that uh, makes you a target. That's one issue I can see. The other issue I can see is that since he's the creator, people may have suspicion that he could go in and manipulate the software and change it. So him not being at the helm was better for Bitcoin because now it's truly a uh, a, a public um, measure a uh, public storage of wealth, I guess, rather than a one person who invented it controlling it. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, Moment, I have a question. Uh, now, transactions that involve only cryptocurrency can remain anonymous, but once you use Bitcoin to purchase a physical thing like a Tesla, and that Tesla has to be delivered to you at a physical address, and uh, you'll be the owner. Uh, how is that? How, how is that reconciled with an anonymity? Right. So when you are buying something physical, you know you are not anonymous, and uh, so uh, in that way, it's not really anonymous, even though it was. Uh, a few years back, but the government has figured out a way to get into it. Uh, I'm not sure whether you heard that recent story where uh, there was a uh, ransomware that shut down our uh, gas pipeline. So they paid uh, the uh, people who had uh, generated the ransomware uh, $30 million or somewhere around there in Bitcoins. So, so uh, the uh, federal government was able to track down those Bitcoins and recover them. So it is possible now. But back in the day, you know, five years ago, uh, there was a lot of shady stuff going on uh, uh, where drugs are being bought and sold with Bitcoins and stuff. Uh, and nobody could track it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so now uh, as a good question you brought up about the Tesla, but there is a benefit to Bitcoins. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of benefits to Bitcoin. But one of the benefits is that uh, the currency exchange is a problem for uh, foreign people. Now, a very good example is, uh, uh, you know, I come from uh, another country where uh, it's really difficult to exchange money. So from the local, from the place I come, to take local money and convert it to dollars is very difficult because the government tries to hold on to a certain amount of dollars in their coffers, and they don't want people to buy dollars and send it out of the country. So it's very tightly regulated, and there are many countries like that. Now, one of the issues that um, parents, for instance, they run into back where I come from, back in many other countries, is that they'd send their children to say college here. And uh, now they have to pay tuition, pay their expense, and the government won't let them buy, convert their 
money, local money into dollars to pay for tuition here. Uh, that's a big problem. So now then they have to ask uh, friends and family to pay the tuition. Then they, are, they want to reimburse them in the local currency. And it's a big mess. So with Bitcoin, all that goes away. Uh, you just pay the, you buy the Bitcoin over the platform and then pay the university with Bitcoins. Or you want to buy your uh, daughter who is studying abroad a Tesla, you just pay Tesla with a Bitcoin and car appears in a dorm room. So you're basically bypassing this whole banking system and all this currency exchange and all these regulations and the governments. Aren't we yeah. also bypassing the entire tax system of all of the nations? And if that is the case, how on earth do the nations survive past that with infrastructure? Right. That's a very good point. And that's where the government is trying to get into these transactions. And eventually they will. So to take your example of the university and the fees were paid in Bitcoin. Now I own the university and I've got all this Bitcoin. What do I do with it? Uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, uh, well. There are two, two stuff with Bitcoin. If I start to convert it into dollars, now I get into strange money laundering situations, don't I? Yeah. So there are there are two th two aspects to Bitcoin. So there are many aspects to Bitcoin, but there are two of them that I can discuss. One is one is yes. Uh, one is it was designed to make transactions uh, easier and quicker. So one of the examples they use in the white papers and the papers is that. For a banking system to um, uh, have a transaction, uh, it takes you know several days because the banks are only open eight to five, weekends are closed, so uh, it takes time. Whereas for a Bitcoin transaction to happen is twenty minutes, so that is one issue, one benefit. The other benefit is that uh, the value holding of wealth or preservation of wealth. So if you save your life savings in dollars, you are in a lose-lose situation because they will keep printing money and you are going to get devalued to uh, half in 10 years or 20 years. However, with Bitcoin having its limited supply, it's a, um, there is a good term for it, a storage of wealth or something. Yeah. Um, so it's a good storage of wealth because it's a limited number. So you can count on it for it to go up and not lose its value because some government decides to print more for whatever reason. So those are the two uh, main arguments for Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Now the flip argument is that, you know, the, you don't, uh, government doesn't have a means to collect taxes and taxes have to be paid for, for uh, building the infrastructure. Does that answer your question? Uh, partially, I, I still see a wide disconnect between the macroeconomic theory that runs the world right now and a, a fixed currency that is non-traceable. Uh, the disconnect to me is, is a management issue that I don't see any real solution to. Um, okay. Once I'm under the radar with any form of currency, the taxation system fails immediately. Um, if, if it fails immediately, then we're in this position where there are no national assets to be deployed. <clears throat> And you are, you are very correct, is that it is not designed to take over dollars. It was not designed to replace dollars. Uh, so the idea of Bitcoin was, one was preservation of wealth. And I think that was his main, main motivation, is preservation of wealth, because... Uh, uh, because governments at the time were printing money in 2009. Uh, uh, and the other one was 
you know, uh, peer to peer transactions, you take government out of it. Uh, but, but I don't think he thought it through to that level that it would be, uh, it, it would replace dollar. And, uh, the other thing I would say is that this is essentially a uh, asset class. So it's become an asset class. So it is just like stocks and bonds and it's now cryptocurrencies and asset class. Um, excuse me a uh, mo moment. My understanding is that every time you use cryptocurrencies, can you hear me? I just lost you, go ahead, please repeat it again. Okay, my understanding is that every time you use cryptocurrencies to purchase um, anything or to transfer that those into your bank account, that that is a taxable event. That's my understanding. So now once it becomes an asset class or the government I think has already made it an asset class. So uh, this is the first year I saw that uh, in my tax forms, Bitcoin was mentioned. So it, there, there was a place, there was a line item which said that have you bought or sold any Bitcoins? So it, now it has become an asset class, which basically means is that if you buy or sell, you would have to pay transaction costs on the profits. Just like if you sell GM stocks and if you sold it at a higher price than you bought it at, you have to pay taxes on the difference. Uh, same thing applies to Bitcoins. The big difference is though that the Bitcoin transaction is non-traceable. The stock transaction is traceable. So right now it's on our system. <laughs> That's why they just have a line item. There's no way you don't get issued a 1099 saying that you sold Bitcoins uh, at this moment. All right, that's good discussion. I'll move on in the interest of time. Okay, so let's talk about how is money created. In ancient civilizations, money was created to facilitate exchange of goods, goods, trade, and commerce. Egyptians and Persian kings minted gold and silver coins with their likeness. Coins had value because they were guaranteed by kings that they will be accepted throughout the kingdom. In modern times, money is created by government to the constitution. In US, money is minted by Department of Treasury. The supply of money is determined by Federal Reserve. In Europe, central banks control the money supply. Okay, how is Bitcoin created? So Bitcoin is created by the operation called Bitcoin mining. So mining is a record keeping service done through the use of computer processing power. Miners keep the blockchain consistent, complete and unalterable by repeatedly grouping newly broadcast transactions into a block. So that uh, all the transactions that are happening in the ether uh, with Bitcoin is being stored in a blockchain. Miners provide a service to a Bitcoin ecosystem. In return, they are rewarded with Bitcoins. Total supply of Bitcoin is limited to 21 million by the Bitcoin algorithm. So and Nakamoto in his original software put the 21 million in there. So it's going to stay there till eternity. And, uh, and that's, that's the price of it keeps going up. So I'll go over some numbers later. Uh, I don't want to spoil the suspense, but, uh, but yeah, so right now the Bitcoin is at 38,000 a piece. All right, how to own a Bitcoin. So you can create a Bitcoin wallet by downloading an app to your device. The app will generate a Bitcoin address, acquire Bitcoin by purchasing it, 
earn Bitcoin by accepting it as payment for goods or services. Okay. So how is Bitcoin transacted? A transaction is a transfer of value between Bitcoin wallets that gets included in the block. So you would disclose your Bitcoin address to a business or people you plan to pay or receive payment from. Bitcoin wallets keep a secret piece of data called the private key or the seed, which is used to sign the transaction, providing a mathematical proof that they have come from an owner of the wallet. The signature also prevents the transaction from being altered by anybody once it has been issued. All transactions are broadcast to the network and usually begin to confirm within 10 to 20 minutes to the process of call, uh, call mining. So what is happening is that once a transaction goes through, it is sent to uh, literally thousands of computers. The computers create the blocks. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the mechanism, but I believe that whoever closes the block, creates and closes a block first and is authenticated, gets paid. It's kind of like a competition. Any questions so far? I have one. There's a finite number of Bitcoins. The miners will eventually run out of Bitcoins to mine, as I can understand it. Is that correct? Yes. So in the white paper, he talks about that. So he says that after all the bitcoins have been mined they will have there is another means of paying the miners so miners are the uh, you know uh, people or the systems that that uh, that maintain the ecosystem so they have to be paid because they are providing a service and as so he has a mechanism to pay them after all the 21 million are mined uh, right now, I think to this date, uh, 14 million or so, 15 million are mined and counting. So it's getting to the end pretty fast. Now the valuation of the Bitcoins is in the 725 billion at this point. It hit a trillion. Um, it is expected to hit the maximum uh, number uh, that the experts are theorizing will be 2.1 trillion. So it will hit 2.1 trillion market cap. At that point, each Bitcoin will cost about 120,000 120, each. So on my, go ahead. One of the ways of acquiring a Bitcoin is to buy it. I mean, just using small numbers, if I had $10 and say, I wanna buy $10 worth of Bitcoin, how do I go about that? Somehow the $10 has to evaporate and that equivalent amount of Bitcoin has to appear on my computer. Who do I give the $10 to? Okay, so so Bitcoin has uh, fractions. So there is a milli Bitcoin and a micro Bitcoin. So, so with a say ten dollars, you might be buying, a, you know, nano Bitcoin or something. Uh, but you are buying it from uh, you are buying it from someone who owns it. So it's kind of like a stock. So, you know, to buy a stock, you go to a brokerage, you know, you log into your brokerage. And you buy. Uh, but if you might want to mute everybody. Some people are unmuted. So I, I have a, a question. Why would there be a maximum cap value on the limited supply of Bitcoin? Um, in, inflation's a fact of life and it's not likely to change. So with the, the cap value is set against what, the dollar? and the dollar is going to continue to inflate in some way, shape or form. So wouldn't the maximum value of the Bitcoin be op open-ended? 
Yeah, this is a subject that uh, I haven't wrapped my head around. This is like one of those things where, uh, you know, they say that the world's population can only go up to 8 billion. After that, it will stop growing, it will top out. And I don't understand what uh, uh, theoretical basis of that is, but, you know, that is an accepted fact, I guess. This is similar. They're using some metrics and some equations to determine that uh, there is a top. But you could theorize the maximum number of people in the world based on various. I saw an article years ago that said the maximum number of people in the world would be determined by the amount of heat that they generate. And when the Earth's unable to dissipate that heat, it will get too hot for people to live. People die, but Bitcoins aren't going to die, are they? I don't know. I couldn't answer that, but that's there are papers that say that it will top out at 2.1 trillion uh, market cap. So, uh, on my last talk, uh, there was a question: uh, Governments give value to currency by guaranteeing its acceptance. How is the value of cryptocurrency created? So the answer is value of crypto currency is created by the marketplace. Its value increases by its acceptance by the market. An example is when Tesla announced that it will accept Bitcoin as payment for its cars, the value of Bitcoin went up. Similarly, uh, when Nicaragua and uh, president and prime minister said that they will accept Bitcoin as a legal tender, the price of it went up 10% in one day. I think that will happen this past Monday. So, so as more and more entities accept it as a asset class or, or a payment method, price, you know, price of it will go up. So the market decides. If everybody says that it's a bad idea, then the price will go down. And that was, that was the reasoning behind Nakamoto's white paper. But my understanding is that Tesla rescinded their uh their deal with Bitcoin, that they no longer accept Bitcoin as payment. Right, so he waffle waffles, uh, Elon Musk. Sometimes he says he will and then he won't. And then now he is saying is that uh, if the Bitcoin mining operation becomes more energy efficient, he'll start accepting it again. So this is one of the counter arguments for uh, Bitcoin is that Bitcoin mining operation takes exorbitant amount of energy. So there is a there is a company in Colorado uh, that mines specializes in mining Bitcoin, and I'll go over their charts later. Uh, they in in their uh, quarterly report, they basically brag about how many water cooled you know supercomputers they own parallel processors they own. And, and one of the metrics they use for them doing really well is how much energy they consume. So in the last quarterly report, they mined uh, uh, 200 Bitcoins or $200 million worth of Bitcoins. And they, they are using 33 megawatts of power to run their computers. All right. I have a so, question. Yeah, go ahead. It seems to me that if governments try to use Bitcoin as their currency, that's a government that is essentially a corrupt routine or regime rather, because now all their financial information is hidden, but they have to buy Bitcoins in some kind of world government traded funds, dollars, pounds, uh, ruples, whatever, I don't know. But once you bury it inside of Bitcoin, now you have a corrupt regime because the people who own the, the keys to the accounts can move money and expend money at will without anyone seeing it. So Bitcoins as a, as a national currency seems to me to do nothing but facilitate a corrupt government. Uh, the prime minister didn't say that they will make Bitcoin their 
primary currency, they said that they will accept it as a legal tender. So it was, it was basically marketplace accepting it. They're not replacing one thing. They're not replacing the Caribbean dollar with Bitcoin. They're just saying that, uh, you know, we'll accept it as if somebody wants to pay taxes in the it, with Bitcoins, we'll accept it. Yeah. Well, yeah, as soon as they say, you must pay your taxes with Bitcoins, which will come very shortly after that, then it's a corrupt system because you and I, or whoever the citizens are, have no visibility into the system. Um, excuse me, can I say something here, please? Yes, go ahead. My, my understanding is that one of the um, benefits of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin are that it's actually a transparent system where everybody can see all the transactions at any time and it's impossible to hide anything as do currently, um, you know, a lot of um, entities or governments or whatever. Uh, yes, you're right. It's, it's open, it's an open source. So, I mean, that was one of the uh, uh, arguments that the Bitcoin believers use all the time is that it's an open source, it's, it's driven by market. It's, so everybody has access to the information and that's a good thing. Well, well, they have access to the transaction. They have no access to the transactors. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, to your point on the other uh, issue with the Nicaragua, uh, there might be an you know, ulterior motive for uh, the government saying that they will accept Bitcoin as legal tender because in the early days, Bitcoins were um, predominantly owned or the transactions were predominantly being made by uh, drug dealers and then illegal activity. So um, a lot of the uh, drug dealers probably have Bitcoins. Now, if the government says that I oh, will accept Bitcoins as taxes, maybe they can, the government can cash in on the, <laughs> on the, on the taxes. And excuse me, one other point that I would like to just quickly say is that it is an option to blind your wallet to a number, but that it's, um, but it, that's only an option. It's not necessary. A person can also create their wallet that reveals their identity. And so they can operate with either the blinded or the, or their actual identity. So um, there's that. That's good information because, you know, like if you want to open a bank account, for instance, you have no choice. You have to give them your social security number, your name, your birth date of birth, you know, all your personal information. However, here you have an option. And that is the freedom that the Bitcoin believers think that we all deserve. All right, moving on in the interest of time. So investment opportunities in Bitcoin. So Bitcoins can be bought through Bitcoin wallets. Um, Bitcoin uh, mining companies. Companies that provide uh, Bitcoin trading platforms. So these are all the uh, investment opportunities. We can invest in Bitcoin trusts and we can invest in Bitcoin ETFs. ETF stands for exchange traded funds. Is there a question? I'm hearing some background noise. Okay, moving on. So Bitcoin, so this is a, a old chart. This is the chart from the last time I gave the talk. Uh, Bitcoin was at $55,000 each. It's market cap was $1 trillion. And this is basically the chart from February. In February, it was at 35,000, then it hit the peak. Uh, I think this is the peak when Elon Musk said he'll start accepting. It hit that. Then he said another tweet, so it went down. Then, it's, then the Nicaragua thing happened. I think this is the Nicaragua thing, this peak. And then now it's, then went down again. 
Okay, this is the latest chart that I downloaded today. So Bitcoin is at 38,000. So from 55,000, it has gone down to 38,000. And partly because uh, Elon Musk said that he'll stop accept, uh, accepting it. And there were some white papers written by some investors about the energy convention, uh, energy consumption of mining and how uh, not green Bitcoin is. So the market cap of the Bitcoin has gone down to 725 billion from one trillion. All right, so another way to invest, by the way, by no means, this is a investment advice. This is just for information. So this is another company that um, it's called Riot Blockchain. It is in the business of mining uh, Bitcoins. This is a company I was talking about that consumes uh, 33 megawatts of energy to drive their computers for mining Bitcoins. It happens to be in Colorado, which is interesting because all the most of the mining companies of United States, traditional mining companies of the United States uh, are in Colorado. This is an electronic mining company, which is also in Colorado. Um, recently, the CEO of Riot was in the CNBC Financial News Network, and uh, they were asking him about the energy consumption uh, required to mine Bitcoins and why it was so high and so on and so forth. And his argument was that uh, the gold miners, for instance, or platinum miners, they, they use their big machinery and dig into the earth and uh, consume exorbitant amount of fossil fuel to uh, recover uh, small you know, uh, pieces of a valuable uh, product and thus they create value. So uh, Bitcoin miners are doing the same thing. They are consuming energy to create value. Uh, it's no difference. The only difference is that the Bitcoin miners can, can target or shift their energy consumption to times when renewables are uh, easily available. And, uh, not use it when renewables are not, the renewable energy is not being generated. <laughs> All right, moving on. So another way that uh, uh, one can invest in Bitcoins is uh, investing in Bitcoin platform companies. So one of the platform companies called Coinbase, the uh, symbol is coin, and this is its, uh, this is its stock value chart. It recently went, you know, few few months ago, it went public. So it hasn't done any exceptional. It just started high and then went down and stays there. Stayed there. Another uh, method to invest uh, in Bitcoin is purchasing Bitcoin ETF. ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. So one of them is Bitcoin Fund. Its symbol is QBTC. Now this is not traded in uh, US markets. This is traded in Canadian market. So um, they don't have a trust in US market yet. So there is another, here's a Bitcoin trust. So there is, a, um, I take that back, there are, trusts in the United States market, they don't have ETFs in the United States market yet. So there is a difference. So another Bitcoin trust is GBTC, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. It essentially buys Bitcoins and holds it. And you buy a 
uh, retail investor will buy the company's shares in the company. So as the as the price of Bitcoin fluctuates, the price of the share fluctuates. So you're essentially indirectly buying Bitcoins. Um, excuse me, moment. Can I um, offer a tip here? I think it's a really good idea to buy these. Um, to buy, if you're going to buy Grayscale, to buy it in a Roth IRA because then when you sell it, you don't have to pay the capital gains that could supposedly go up to forty percent. So this, I think, is a good way to invest in the. And the Grayscale has four coins, not just Bitcoin, but this is a better way to invest in Bitcoin because if you just buy through something like PayPal or Coinbase, then when you sell it, you have to pay high capital gains. So that's just one tip for investors that I've been thinking about. Now, the one thing to be careful about is that uh, the price of the grayscale Bitcoin does not directly reflect the price of the Bitcoin itself. There is a premium built into it. And that premium is tied to the speculation. So when people are optimistic about Bitcoin, the price of Grayscale may go higher than the Bitcoin itself. Uh, vice versa, if people are pessimistic about Bitcoin, then the price of Grayscale Bitcoin may go down more than than the Bitcoin itself. So something to note. My understanding is it's a 6% is how much they charge. For you 6% that. is the cost. Now there is a market-based premium, which is which varies. It's on a sliding scale. So you will find that it does not track the Bitcoin itself. So you will find that if Bitcoin went up one day 10%, Grayscale may not go up 10%. It should, but it doesn't. And that is the difference between a trust and an ETF. On an ETF, it will track percentage by percentage. Like there is a gold ETF, symbol is GLD, and it is the price of a uh, ounce of gold divided by 10. So if the gold price is 1800, the price of GLD is 180. If price of gold goes to 2000, price of GLD will be 200. It tracks. However, you will find that GBTC will not track Bitcoin, you know, uh, percentage for percentage. It's kind of, it is connected, but this connection is kind of spongy. It's elastic connection. All right, so there are other cryptocurrencies. Uh, other cryptocurrencies are- One question before we move on, Marmin. Um, you had, your chart earlier showed that the Bitcoin over the, I think over the, over the first three or four months of this year, its cost had escalated by um, about a hundred percent in three months. And it also, there are also instances there where it looked like it had crashed by about 20 or 30% over a matter of a couple of days. So to me, this volatility would be a huge problem. Um, I was teaching in Turkey about 20 years ago when the inflation rate there was around 90%. You could put money in the bank and get 80% interest on it. But what was fascinating was a whole bunch of financial systems just didn't exist anymore. There was no such animal as a mortgage. There's no point in getting a mortgage if you're paying 100% interest. <laughs> um, and any loan of any sort was pretty much unviable. And it was extremely difficult to change money. Um, a million Turkish lira at the time was $4. But the next day, it could be two or eight. And um, they had huge economic problems. And it seems to me like Bitcoin is a vehicle that could create exactly the same problems in its own financial network. Also. Well, if you've got a variation of 100% in a matter of three months or a drop of 
in a matter of two days and everybody's using Bitcoin, what interest rate are you going to charge me to borrow it? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. If, if you look at it that way, yes, you have a valid point. It's definitely not stable and it has issues. And by no means, I am a uh, proponent of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm just looking at it uh, intellectually. Uh, so my understanding is that Nakamoto started it as an inflation hedge or a uh, value storage because he was ticked off with the government's printing money. That was it. Now, it's become a lot more than that. Uh, and now we are debating whether it will take over dollars. You know, Trump makes a statement that uh, Bitcoin is competing with dollars, which is, he doesn't like it because dollars should be the world currency. Some people have been talking about Bitcoin being the world currency. And then China has been talking about storing their surplus in Bitcoin rather than in, in dollars. So, uh, so now it has gotten all these dimensions, uh, but I don't think Nakamoto uh, even fathomed that this will get all these dimensions. Now the people who are the believers say that, you know, there was a need for it, need for something like this. And a need was uh, driven by the bad behavior of the central banks. And it's gotten so much traction because of that. All right, we went through this. Okay, so Bitcoin exchange traded funds. So there is one, but it's not in the United States yet. This is traded in uh, Canadian markets. So there is some issue with starting an ETF United States for Bitcoins. And I don't know what that is, but there hasn't been one yet. I'm sure many people are trying to open one. So Bitcoin Trust, okay. So there are other cryptocurrencies that are well known. Ethereum is one of them, ETH, Bitcoin Cash, BCH. There is a Litecoin, Chainlink. Uh, since I did this talk, there was another one called Dogecoin. I'm sure everybody's heard about that. One of the claim to fame about Dogecoin is it's not limited, so it can the numbers can be increased. So, so that one costs costs fractions of a penny. All right, that's all I have. There was any other questions? I have one question about uh, transfer of assets. So if somebody owns Bitcoins, how is this transfer to, uh, to family and inheritors? Because if it's anonymous, then nobody knows about it, right? Yeah. So, so what happens to it when the person dies? Yeah, so you will transfer the wallet. So there is a mechanism to transfer the wallet. Now, it, it has happened that people have lost the wallet or the computer that the wallet existed got thrown out and, uh, and they lost it and there was no way to recover it. Right. So when somebody loses the Bitcoins in that way, do the value of the remaining Bitcoins increase? That's a good question. I don't have the stats on that, that how many Bitcoins have been lost there. Mm. And it would be hard to, you know, quantify because. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So in my last talk, there was a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is there a question? Okay. In my last talk, there was a question by an audience, can Bitcoin be mined with personal computers? So the answer is, in the beginning, it was possible to mine Bitcoin with PCs. Now the blockchain has become very large and complicated. And so it requires fast computers with many, many parallel processors. 
and large memory banks to mine Bitcoin. And also this very competitive, so literally thousands of people with computers, thousands of companies with computers are competing for the same Bitcoin. Is there any um, measure of dollar-wise how much money it costs to mine a Bitcoin at this point in time? That would uh, be tied to the uh, energy consumption, I suppose. So uh, I don't have a number, but that's a, I'll look it up. That's a good question. Thank you. I, I have another comment, if I may, moment. By the way, I, I really enjoyed the presentation you've done. A very good job of simplifying a very complex issue. There is um, an academic organization called Sailor um, Academy, I think, or University, S-A-Y-L-O-R, like Taylor with an S. And they have a very extensive free Bitcoin course. When I say extensive, it, ha it probably takes 80 hours to work your way through it. Um, but it, but it, it's sort of interesting, um, and I thought people might be interested in that. The, the university itself is very much a political entity, and I don't subscribe to its politics, but the course itself is politically free. That's good. That's good information. Thank you. And thanks for the Do you have to pay time. with Bitcoin to take that course? I'm sorry? You have to pay with Bitcoin to take the course. Ah, I have to pay with no bits of any coin, which is good. <laughs> Uh, okay. Right. Other questions? That's all I have. Thanks for your attention. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Momen. It's just um, about the time we normally end around eight o'clock. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And we look forward to next month's presentation on EV technology. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you all, all right. for joining. Yeah, bye everybody. I'm going to end the meeting.